have a seat. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us online. We got a few watching. I, I know that. And um, let me just go ahead and uh, apologize now. If I say anything that's like, where did that come from? I don't understand what he's saying. Uh, about 24 hours ago, I was getting off a plane from, from Wales. So uh, I'm a little jet lagged still. So if I say anything that sounds off cr- kind of crazy, it's because it is. It's just going to be crazy. Um, so uh, so there was a good news. I got off the plane in, um, at about 7 p.m., something like that, last night. The bad news is my luggage didn't uh, didn't get off the plane, didn't get on the plane, apparently. So, um, uh, But I still have some clothes to wear. But uh, anyways, uh, how many of you think that you have a good reputation? I mean, you can't, I'm, don't, you know, that, you don't have to raise your hand or, you know, don't give me all oh, that. How do you know? I mean, how do we know if we have a good relationship? Just, these are just rhetorical questions. Don't, please don't answer these out loud. But how do we know if you have a good reputation or not, right? How do you know? I mean, maybe it's just because of how people treat you or, or you have a lot of friends or you have a lot of followers on Facebook or some social media or, you know, you, whatever. You have a lot of, what is it on chit chat or uh, chit chat? Snapchat. See, I'm already talking about crazy stuff. Snapchat. Is it, is it friends or followers on Snapchat? Well, how, what is it called on Snapchat? Anybody know? Friends, friends on Snapchat? Okay. So it, that's how you judge whether you're not you're, you have a good reputation because you're popular. Um, what about your character? How do you know if you have a, uh, if you're a person of good character? Uh, and what is the difference? Is there a difference between reputation and your character? Is there a difference between your reputation that you have and your character? There is, and we'll get into that a little bit t- tonight. Um, as you know, we're walking through. Um, just the, the book of first Timothy and, um, and so tonight we're in chapter three. So if you want to go ahead, if you have your Bible, if you have your phone or your tablet or whatever you have it memorized, just in your mind, go to first Timothy chapter three, and we'll be looking at a few verses here. Now, let me just tell you this, this specific passage or this really, this whole chapter is actually specifically written for like overseers, deacons, those types of things in the church. But here's the deal. Um, yes, it's written for given qualifications for those that serve in those type of positions. But um, it, it, I, mean, I think it's good information for all of us as well. You may not be a deacon. You may not be uh, that type of an overseer or whatever of a church. But these are still important for just just if we're Christ followers, these are still important for us to live by as well. If it's important enough for someone else to live by it, then it's important for us to try to live by those things too, right? So, so again, I'm not saying that as we're going through this, we're going to go straight through the book. So I'm not going to skip around things. I don't want to skip this one, uh, even though some of it was written on the plane ride home last night. I will say that. Um, but uh, your reputation and your character what do they have to do with following Christ? Obviously, your character does, but what does your reputation have to do with following Christ? So we're going to look at that a little bit tonight. I'll give you an example. Um, yesterday, as I said, um, was a long day for me. It began around 2.30 in the morning. I don't know what that meant here because it's six hours time difference. Uh, anyways, we got up at 2.30 in the morning, got on a bus, wrote, go, went from South Wales into London, Heathrow Airport, uh, to sit for about five or six hours, then get on a plane and flew seven hours, well, uh, yeah, it was, flew nine hours here, um, and, and here's the crazy thing, I told you, you know, my luggage didn't make it, uh, my check luggage didn't make it, the crazy thing is we had no stops, we didn't have like a layover anywhere, we, it was a direct flight, so my, my luggage never even got on the plane, I guess, um, cause it was nowhere to be found. And so, and I, I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of people crowded around this poor girl to, at this counter. She didn't very, barely spoke English, but, and worked at the national airport and everybody, she's handing out these papers to everybody to fill them out. And uh, there was at least 20 people that their luggage was just gone, nowhere to be found, nothing, you know. And, um, anyways, uh, at that moment, um, you know, I, I don't, now I didn't, I didn't say anything that, uh, um, I wasn't completely rude to the, to the young lady that was there, but, but she could tell that me and about 20 other people we were pretty visibly upset, right? 
Nothing wrong with being angry about things. There's nothing wrong with getting upset. Um, But I probably wasn't showing a good character there. Probably wasn't on my best, you know, besides the fact Louie was trying to call me three times while that was happening, I think, while I was trying to talk to this lady. I'm getting phone calls from her trying to figure out where I am because she's in cell phone waiting for me, all of that. It's just kind of crazy. So I wasn't showing good character well, what does that have to do, what does our character or our reputation have to do with fighting the good fight? Remember, we started this series uh, in 1 Timothy, fighting the good fight. We started this series looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse 12, that says, is it on here, Courtney? Yeah, there it is. To fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life with which you were called about and about you were made good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight. Well, what does that mean to to fight the good fight? What does he mean by that? Apparently, Paul knew something that he was trying to pass on to young Timothy, which in turn, the scriptures, because they have been preserved for so many years, now is trying to pass on to us. Fighting the good fight, Paul knew that the life of a Christ follower would become increasingly more difficult and and would get, so we would need that to, as we fight this fight, as we fight, the, the, we walk, the, live the life for Christ, he knew that a Christ follower would become increasingly more difficult and would have to fight for our faith. It, 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 it means God going God's way against the flow of the world, and you would have to agree with that, right? I mean, the world is not going in the direction that God wants it to go in. I'm, I'm, it, I'm, not, I'm not a, you know, I don't have a direct line that anybody else doesn't have to God. I'm just saying, obviously, our world is not moving in the direction that, God would prefer. So we as Christ followers, and since the beginning of time, really have been going against the flow of the world, right? We've been going, we've been swimming upstream. That's, that's kind of what it's all about. So that's what fighting the good fight, it won't be easy. And so he's telling Timothy, you have to have this soldier determination. You have to have this soldier mentality. You, you got to be suited up. It reminds me of Ephesians 6. This will not be on the screen because I thought of this on the plane, I didn't, I didn't send it in time. But it, this, in, in Ephesians 6, where, where Paul writes to the Ephesian believers about the, the spiritual armor. And he talks about how it's important to put on the spiritual armor every single day. It's, it's, remember Paul says we die, he dies daily. Well, we have to do that too. And by dying daily, part of that is, yes, giving of ourselves over to God and giving all of our desires to him, but also suiting up for battle because we are if we're going to live with for christ we're going to walk this walk it's a battle and it's not going to get any easier until christ returns so it, 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 we have to be suited up we have to be prepared well what do we need to be prepared to fight what do we need in order to fight the good fight of faith well, there's a couple things, and your reputation and your character are going to go along with it here. But here's a couple things we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 17, or, I'm sorry, verse 7 to, through about, uh, I don't know, 15, something like that. It's, it's not a great place to start or end, but we're going to do it anyways. So here we go. Verse 7, moreover, so he's saying, he's already listed out a few things. For, for qualification for overseers or, or leaders in the church. But he says, moreover, he must be the person, he, she, does, you know, does, he, uh, may be the person who he's talking about must be well thought of by outsiders. Now, if you're thinking about the movie or the book, The Outsiders, just get that out of your mind. That's not what this is about here, even though that was a really good book. First book I ever read by my, I think, from cover to cover because I, I had to read it in school. Anyways, moreover, uh, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy and dishonest gain. They must, uh, they must hold the mystery of the, of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons and they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slandered, but sober-minded, faithful in all things like let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their de- children and the house and their household, own households well. For those who serve well as deacons, gain a good standing for themselves and, all, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Verse fourteen. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to, to you that so that 
if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the house of God. So Paul's desire is to be with them, but he's like, if I can't be there, I I want you to know how this is how you should live in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and and a buttress for the truth. Okay, I may read that next part in a second, but let's just stop right there for right now. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I know that we've, we've said some things and read some things in here talking about deacons and, and deacons' wives and all that. And, it, and some of it doesn't necessarily pertain to us right now as far as in our specific uh, situation. But Father, as Christ followers, we, we are all uh, called to, to a higher calling. We are all called to live a life that, is, that represents you to other people. God, we know that you are doing something right now as we sang about. And Father, we can't do any of these things that you're calling us to do without you leading us. Father, you are a great God, and and we just want to be used by you. And speak to us tonight through, through every word that I stumble through. I pray that you will be seen, that you will be heard. And we will feel your presence as we already have, but we'll continue to feel your presence in this place. Speak to us now, Father, we're your servants. We long to hear a fresh word from you. Lord, I ask these things in your name. Amen. So what is it that we need? What what do we need in order to fight the good fight? According to Timothy, in order to to, to fight, according to Paul in 1 Timothy, we must have a good reputation. Did you see that in verse 7? He says, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. The, the, that means those that are outside of the faith. We have to have a good reputation. We need a good reputation. Now, does that, I'm not saying that he doesn't say in here, that, uh, 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 what is your reputation? Your reputation is what other people think of you, right? So he's not saying, uh, it's not, he, he doesn't say the word, I know you may be thinking, so I'm supposed to uh, worry about what other people think? No, Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't mention that in here. He doesn't tell us to, to, to the, the, miss, the passage doesn't mention worry or any of that at all. But our reputation needs to be one that glorifies God, even to those who are outside of the faith. Peter says, uh, or I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 22 says this, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold. If we have a poor reputation, what kind of example are we setting for others who we hopefully that we want to, to see God in us. If we have a, if we're not setting a good example for, if our reputation, uh, we mentioned it earlier, we were talking about that's, that's being hypocritical. If we say one thing, but we act another way and listen, nobody in the room is perfect. We're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to say things wrong. We're going to do things wrong. We're going to get mad at the wrong things and say things that we don't mean to say. That's just, that's part of life. I get that. And I'm not making excuses for it, but that's just part of life. But listen, your reputation does matter. It's not the only thing that matters and it shouldn't be on the top of our list is what other people think of us. That's not the point because listen, people are going to think about you, whatever they want to think about you. I used to, you know, I tell you all the time, I'm a recovering people pleaser. I, I still want to pe- please people. I, I'm, not, I'm not fully recovered. I'm still working on that. But, but here, here's the thing. I, um, <clears throat> it's not, it's, so it's, it's not about trying to get other people to like us. Paul doesn't mean that. They may not like us. They may disagree with us. But we have to have a good reputation in the community in order for others to see Christ in us. That, that's, the, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's referring to. In First Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us this. For, you, uh, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. None of, none of these passages say that people have to like us or understand us. It's just we need to set the example for them. And if how we do that is through our reputation. They're making good choices. Not, not because God will love us more, but because others will see it more. They'll see him in us. What's your reputation tell about your relationship with Christ? Does your reputation that you have, does it, does it, 
Does it speak to your relationship with Christ at all? Does it show others that you have a relationship with Christ? Does that mean you can't, that, that's, that's all important is what, what other people think of you? Again, no, that's not what it's about. That's not the objective that I think Paul is getting to here. He's just saying that, listen, if, if we're going to be people of faith, we need to be people of faith in front of other people of faith in the church, but we also need to be people of faith outside of the church so they will see that too. We've got to be consistent there. Our reputation has to be consistent. It has to be, our, you know, the way we behave has to be consistent no matter what, what circumstances or our surroundings that we have. You know, when I was in college, of course, you know, you hang out with, you know, the group of friends that you hang out with, right? If you play a sport in college, you hang out with the, the, all the, those people, you know, the, the whole time. And, and, and reputations begin that way, kind of, right? And those, those teams or whatever have reputations, we got to be careful, not, 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 cost, not, not fearful, not worry, but we got to be able to stand firm even in the midst of those difficult times, even when other people don't, even though we're associated with some other people that may have a different type of reputation, we've got to figure, we, we got to have that about us that, that, that it doesn't matter what other people think, our reputation speaks for itself. I'm not saying that this should be your first priority, your number one priority is, what, oh, what do other people think about me? Because I don't think that's what Paul is writing about. I think he's just telling us, listen, if you're this way around believers, you need to be the same way around non-believers because that affects your reputation. That gives you a good reputation in the community. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes when people find out, if I don't know them already and, I, and I'm you know, uh, on, on a plane, uh, when we were flying to Wales, we, uh, because it's the shortest distance when we flew to Wales, we flew to Chicago first, makes perfect sense to me. I don't know, but, uh, we went the opposite direction and then went to Wales, but <clears throat> I was sitting next to on the long flight from Chicago to Wales. I was sitting next to a guy from Germany and, uh, he has, his wife has some family in California, you know, I, I knew, got to find out way more than I needed to know, but anyways, I was sitting next to this guy who was from Germany, he was going home, uh, but he was going to Heathrow as well, and then catching a flight on to Germany from there, and, um, and we just, we started talking a little bit, and, and, but it's interesting, when they find out, they, meaning anybody, really, they find out what I do, oh, you know, you're a preacher, then they either, they do one of two things, right? They either, they either really pour it on, like, you know, or they just shut down completely. And, and this guy did neither one. I mean, he was, he was really, you know, um, I mean, I had a captured audience. We weren't, we weren't going anywhere. You know, he was in the aisle seat. I was in the middle. So uh, I, I couldn't go any, do anything. He couldn't go anywhere. But it, it, he, it really didn't change his attitude toward me. I don't remember his name. I can't remember. I can't remember what his name was, but it didn't really change his attitude. So that, that's the thing. It's our reputation. We can't be so worried about what other people think. I'm not telling you to do that. And I don't think Paul is making that that argument that we need to worry about what other people think about us. It's just are we consistent wherever we go in our faith? We got to be consistent. Secondly, he says to be in order to fight. Um, not only do we have a good reputation, but we must be a person of good character. Character. Character is, is what, so your reputation is what people think of you. Your character, in, in layman's term, and to dumb it down a little bit, is who you are when no one is around, when no one is looking. That's who you are. Who you are on the inside, that's your character. I went to a Promise Keepers. Anybody heard of Promise Keepers? They were like a big deal back in the late 90s. Uh, it was a gathering of men. Um, it took place, the ones I went to, I went to a couple of them, they were in Atlanta. I mean, there's, there's thousands of men. It's kind of like it was passion before passion uh, for just men. Um, and, uh, but so I went to a couple of them, and, and, and they, were, they were really good. It was, it was a great, great movement, and it, it lasted for a while. I, I think it's still around. It's just it's not as, as big as it was. But, um, but John Maxwell, who's, who's just kind of a, um, an expert on leadership, written a lot of things on leadership. He's been a church pastor before, and, uh, but, but now mostly was a writer, motivational speaker, that type of thing. He, pro, he spoke one year, the first year I went, 
he, he spoke to one of the sessions. I'll never forget. He said, these, he said this about your reputation and your character. He said, our reputation comes from what others believe about our outside. In other words, what others believe about us from what they see. That's our reputation. But he says, our character represents who we are on the inside. Your reputation is what other people see of you. Your character is what is really inside of us. And, and they can go hand in hand. We need it. We see, we must have a good reputation, but we have to have a good character, be a person of good character. Character is on the inside. It's just as important. Look at what Luke says in chapter 8, verse 17. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known to come to light. We may think that we can get away with something for a while, you know, broken character or something. We may think, man, I can get away with this because nobody sees it. Nobody recognizes it. Well, according to Luke, everything will come. It's not going to go unnoticed forever, and, and, but God, God sees and will eventually bring it to light. And we've seen that, haven't we? We've seen that with, with people in the limelight, with people, you know, I guess because it's political season, we see it with politicians quite a bit. We see, you know, they, they portray to be one thing, and, and none of us are, per, again, none of us are perfect. I'm not saying that we should, that we're shooting for perfection here, and that, I'm, not, I'm not casting stones at anyone. I'm just saying we see that a lot here recently, around this time of year, don't we? They profess one thing, but, but their character really doesn't match that up. It didn't match up to what they say. And so we have to be very cautious that our character matches our walk, matches what we say, the words that we say. Is, is, is our character the same? You see, God sees it, and eventually we may think, I can get away with this because nobody sees it. Nobody knows it. But eventually it will come out. Eventually, according to Scripture, God will, will, will it'll, it'll come out. Romans 10, 9 says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, it doesn't matter what you've done. Your character may be flawed from the past, but it doesn't matter what you've done. God still loves you and he has a plan for you. But does your character back that up? Do, do, are, you, are you working on your character so that other people will see Christ in you? He, he, it, In order to fight, we need a good reputation among outsiders. We need those people that are outside of the faith to see what's going on in our lives. I, uh, a couple years ago, I did Leadership Murray. I I don't know if you know what that is. Most counties around, is it just in Tennessee that does it? Other, uh, um, but anyways, a lot of counties in in Tennessee do it. And, and it's, it's, um, man, it's, it's several months, four months, maybe something like that. And it's one week, uh, one day a week, um, and I think it was on Thursday. And and basically, what it is is you just you're with other people in the in the community, and it's run by the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and and you just go see different things of the community. It's all day long, and um, and you have the first the, you know the first weekend they have this retreat, and boy, let me tell you, and uh, it, it's it's uh, they're not really retreating <laughs> when they. When they go on these, it's, it's like they're getting away just to, it's, it's a great thing. And, and I, I would recommend it if, if you want to get to know more about the community and all that and be a part of it. It's, it's a great thing. But there weren't very many people who, who were concerned about their character or reputation on that, at least that first weekend, the orientation weekend. Let me just put it that way. And, and so... When we're put in those situations, does our character change? Does our reputation change, but does our character change? It shouldn't affect it. It shouldn't affect it at all. This past week, I told you, I was in Wales, and we, we did a vacation Bible school. They call it Summer Shine over there. And uh, we had about 70 or 80 children, uh, which it doesn't sound like a lot, but for that area... That's a, that's, I mean, in that church, that was, a, that was a lot of people. It packed that church. Um, and these kids knew nothing about Scripture. They knew, they, they, none of them that we know of, none of them attended church. A few of them, maybe four or five of them attended that church. The others didn't have a church background at all. None. 
some of the people and the parents would come, and, and they didn't have church background. They just, it's com- totally, um, Wales is about 4 million people living in the country. It's not a very big country, but it's, it's less than, um, I think it's less than 10% classifies as, as evangelical. It's, it's a completely dark, lost area. And, and when you're in front of those children or the other people, the other adults that are there, it's important that your character and your reputation, they match up because they, these, these kids are impressionable and they watch, right? They see you. And I'm only there for a week, but, but still they see you and they want to see if, if what you say in here matches what you do over here, right? So our character and our reputation have to be consistent. We need a good reputation in order to fight. We have to have a character be a person of good character or in order to fight the good fight. We can't do it without either one of those. And the last thing that he says, that may be one of the most important, in order to fight, we must remain faithful. We said that before. Remember early on we, in, the, in uh, 1 Timothy, we said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. Why do you think he, he told him to remain Paul told Timothy to remain because he knew it was going to be difficult. I I, I don't know, but I think Paul knew this is going to get difficult. You're going to want to leave. You're going to want to quit. You're going to want to say, you know what? Forget these people. They don't want to follow. I'm done. I'm giving it up. Well, here in verse 14 and 15, he kind of says the same. I hope to come to see you, but I'm writing these things so that if I delay... Don't give up. If I'm late, if I'm, you know, if I get arrested again or whatever happens to me, if I get distracted, I get, I get delayed somehow, my, I don't catch my connecting flight, whatever the case may be, don't give up. Fight the good fight. We must remain faithful because, listen, you're, you're all adults here. We're all adults. Life's not easy, is it? And, and junk just happens. It gets in the way. It always does. And, and we have to be remain. He's encouraging him to stay the course in his absence. Paul is encouraging Timothy in, the, in, in his absence, in Paul's absence, stay the course. Don't give up. You may feel like you want to give up. You're going to feel like you're going to, you want to give up. We all have those feelings. We may feel like that, man, I'm, I'm done. He's telling us, listen, don't, don't give up when you feel like giving up. The grass is not always greener on the other side. It looks a lot better. I've told you this before. You know, I see these, um, I see these billboards or whatever, you know, come, come work for us, truck drivers, you know, make whatever and all this. And I'm like, man, that sounds like such a sweet deal. I don't have to mess with anybody. I don't have to talk to people. I don't have to counsel anybody, you know, in my office. I can just get in the truck and just take a, I know there's stress. I get that. I, you know, I, I get there's, there's stress on the road and all that. Max would know. But I know there's stress with every job. I get all of that. But, boy, sometimes it sure does look better. Other, anything else looks better than what you're doing at the moment, doesn't it? And you know that young Timothy, who was a young pastor in this community, he had to have felt that at times. And we don't have a lot of, of evidence of that other than Paul's words of encouragement to him to remain faithful, to stay the course. Why? Because he knew it was going to get tough. Being a Christ follower is not for the, le- the weak at heart. It, 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 being a Christ follower is not for someone who, who, just, who can't take difficulty Paul desired to be there, but he just, at this moment, he simply could not be there. What do we do when we feel like we're all alone? Well, number one, we know that we're, we're not all alone because Christ promises that he is with us wherever we go. He's always with us. But, but sometimes that's, it's not the same, is it? And I'm not trying to diminish the power of Christ at all, but sometimes it's not the same because we don't have that person you know, physically right there with us. I, I, I've, I, you know, we, uh, when we go to Wales, we, we 
to uh, work with some church plants over there. And we go to Cincinnati, we work with a church planter. And so I've gotten to know a lot of church planters over the last few years. And, and man, let me tell you something. You want to talk about a lonely road. Planting a church is a lonely road. I can't, I can't say that because I've done it. I'm just saying that because I've seen it many, many times. It is a lonely, lonely place, especially when you're planting a church in the middle of nowhere or, or away from anybody that you know. That, that's a lonely place. But, but he says here, even the, so he's encouraging Timothy, and we need to encourage these people. The, the, even we feel like we're the only ones doing it. We feel like, man, we're not... We're just not clicking on all cylinders. We've got to remain faithful. Things aren't going great. We've got to remain faithful. We can remain faithful in several ways. We remain faithful just by showing up. We remain faithful by spending time in God's word, by by spending time on our knees before God. That's how we remain faithful because we're going to want to give up. We're going to want to give up. Um, at our last church, I don't know if I shared this with you. Well, I didn't share it with you last week because we didn't have last week. Um, but I, at my last church, I've served two churches in 20, I don't know, 22, 23 years, something like that. Great, both of them have been great churches. They, they've been good to us, good to my family. They, I mean, I haven't had a bad experience and you have, you have difficult experiences, but I haven't been burned by either church, which is not, you know, everybody can't say that. And I'm not saying that as a boastful thing. That's not about me. It's about the church that I've been blessed to serve at. But there was a couple, we went through a season in my last church where there were some Sundays when I remember waking up and I being totally rest. I, I don't, I don't want to go today. <laughs> I, don't, I won't go somewhere. I, I'd rather just do nothing else. I would do anything else but go to church today because it just felt, man, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to fight the battle. And, and not that it's like horrible and, and I'm not saying that, that it's, it, there's these, it's a, it, you know, it's, I'm not trying to make it sound more dramatic than it is, but you know, this, this whole season in the life of our church at our first family, I know all of you don't go there, but I, here recently I've had a couple of those days too. Just because things are just so unsettled, right? Giving up is never the right answer. Giving up and giving in is, is never the right answer. We have to remain faithful, even when we don't want to. Now, I'm not saying that God may not call you somewhere else and, and call you, and I'm not talking about that. Just giving up because you don't want to be there anymore. Just be giving up because it's just it, it, you don't like it anymore. That's not a good enough excuse. Um, I don't I don't know if this fits in or not. But as when I got home last night, <clears throat> Lou Ray was asking me. I think it was later later last night. She was asking me, well, "What's it like over there? What in, in in Wales or in England, UK? What's it? What do they? How do they? How do they live? You know, what, what kind of what are the houses like?" And and it's very modern. I mean, it's you know, you have Wi-Fi pretty much everywhere you go. And and but I said, you know, a couple of things that that I noticed over the ten years that I've been going or so. We're very we meaning Americans. We're very spoiled. We we have we have we have so many things that we just take for granted, and we're lazy. And they they recycle everything. They every house that I've ever been in has a recycling bin and a trash bin. Or, or you know, uh, rubbish, that's what they call it, rubbish bin or whatever. Um, so, and they have it all over, all on the street. They have all, everywhere. They have, they recycle everything. And then some of you may recycle, but I don't. I mean, not, not, not intentionally, I don't recycle. So everybody over there does. And, and the houses, while, while they're nice, they're usually pretty small, much smaller than what we're used to in many cases. I mean, they're smaller than some of the apartments that, that we may have. That, but th- they're okay with that. I mean, they, they, they don't want to settle for less either. I'm not saying that, but th- these are all Christians that we were hanging, that we were spending time with. But they, don't, they didn't have all the stuff that, 
that my, in my experience, the people that I've gotten close to there, they're not, they're not consumed with stuff like I am. I'm consumed with stuff sometimes. And I'm not very content. But he says, we got, we got to remain faithful. Even when things aren't great, even when things aren't going so good, I, you know, when I was staying with these friends, that, uh, we stay in host homes, which is, which is fascinating because you really get to know the culture there. And I was looking at the house, and it's a, it's a newer house. It's a nice house, but it may be half the size of my house. And I'm thinking, man, I, I don't know if I could live in this. <laughs> how, how terrible is that? I mean, the, the, the person that I was staying with, he and his wife, his name's Kevin Green. He's just a great, great friend, become a great friend over the years and just a great man of God. And he, he, he wants so badly to see his community won from, by, by Christ, won to Christ. And he, he's just, he's, he, they're struggling financially. It, it looks, when you drive around, which I, I didn't, I just rode around with them, but um, it's a good thing I didn't drive over there, but you drive around, and you see these gas stations, and you think, man, gas is pretty cheap over here. It's like 185 or something like that. Well, it's 185 per liter, not gallon. So it comes out to about 7 or $8 a gallon, basically, equivalent over here. That, that's what their gas cost right, is right now, and that's in Wales. And so it, the, they're feeling the effects of it too. And, and listen, but he's, their, their church was a church plant, and it was small anyways, and COVID hit, and they, it, they, have, they haven't, they may not make it. They may not make it as a church plant. Because it's just not, the, the, it, nothing's adding, it, the bills aren't adding up, right? It's just not adding up. So they're trying, but they're trying to remain faithful. Why? Because that's what Christ followers do. To fight the good fight, we have to remain faithful. Peter tells us in 2 Peter, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. What does it confirm and, and calling? What does confirm your calling mean? It means to continue to grow in your relationship, but also to continue to speak boldly about Christ. Share him boldly with others. For us as believers, Christ has delayed his coming. I don't, I don't know why he isn't letting me in on that. So, but the longer he delays, we just got to remain faithful. There was, uh, in one of the, the letters in Thessalonians that, that Paul wrote, he, he kind of chastised the Thessalonian believers because they really believed that Christ was coming back in their lifetime. So they just quit. They just started, it was probably like today. They, they, everybody quit their jobs, you know, and, and they just stayed at home. They were just, they're like, Christ is coming back. We're not, we're stopping. We're not doing anything. And Paul's kind of chastising them about, I mean, you still got to work. We still got to do all these things. We can't just sit and wait for Christ to come back. He is coming, but we don't know when. So we got to live life for Christ, our lives to glorify him. Maybe his delaying is coming because he wants to see more people get saved. Maybe, just maybe, it's because he sees the benefits that we simply can't see. The struggles that we go through are actually kind of benefits in disguise. We don't know it at the moment, but later on, we'll, we'll, hopefully, we'll see that. Maybe that's part of the reason. He's not punishing us by delaying his coming. He's strengthening us by delaying his coming. He is coming again. Make no mistake. He is coming again. I don't know when it will be, but he will be coming again. He's delaying for his own purposes, for, 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 for his own reasons. But listen to what John says, this last verse. He says, let what, you, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son of the Father. And this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. If you say that Christ lives in you, then just do as he did. But remain faithful. Don't give up. 
Don't, don't slack off. Uh, so, listen, we all have that, that. We all are prone to that. I, I'm, I'm, ask any of my family. They know I'm, I'm very prone to that. Just to take a break, you know. There's nothing wrong with taking a break, but I'm just, don't, 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 don't give up. Just because things aren't going the way that you want them to go at the moment, don't give up. Remain faithful. Why? Because he re- is remaining faithful to you. And he desires that from us. Well, let me ask you this as we close. Does my reputation, you ask this to yourself, does my reputation or my character give evidence that I am fighting a good fight? People around you, do they notice something different about you? Not because you're better, not because you, you know, you're better looking, not, that has nothing to do with it. Not because you do anything better than anybody else. Not because you're some superstar Christian and you know all the answers. But is there, is there, there has to be evidence. There has to be evidence in our life that we are a Christ follower. And that comes through in our reputation, and it definitely comes through in our character. Is that seen from others? Again, we don't do it so others will see us. We do it so others will see Christ in us. That's what it's about. Does your reputation and character give evidence? And then ask this to yourself, what do I need to do to change to remain faithful? What, how does my life need to look? What can I do in my life in some way to, that will help me to remain faithful? What are some things I need to give up that will help me remain faithful to Christ? We all got something. We all got something. What can we do to, to remain faithful? to Christ as he delays his coming. All of these are part of what we need to do as we fight the battle, fight the good fight that God has called us to. Thanks again so much for being with us tonight, viewing online. I hope you enjoyed your experience here tonight. We'd love to see you next week or tomorrow night. We have a small group here at 630 uh, in the front room. Please join us. We would love for you to be here for that. Let me leave this with you. We do this every week, this blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance or his face upon you and give you peace. Our prayer for you this week, for all of us, is that we would go in peace with the grace, knowledge, and love that Jesus Christ has given to us. That our reputation and our character will reveal that relationship with him. Thanks for coming. Have a good night.